Uncomfortable is a series in the Mississippi Book Festival podcast, Right on Mississippi, which is presented in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening. I am Ebony Lumumba, Mississippi Book Festival board member, a professor of English at Jackson State University. And I am joined today uh, by Wyatt Tumor, a Liberian American author who has written a groundbreaking novel, She Would Be King, and has followed that up with her memoir, The Dragons, The Giant, The Women, which is a juggernaut in itself. So I'm going to uh, yield the floor to Wayatu, who's going to uh, grace us with her voice and reading some of her own work, and then we're gonna chat a little bit. Welcome, Wayatu, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, thank you for the support. I'm so happy to be a part of the Mississippi Festival. And thank you for that gracious introduction, Ebony. Um, I am going to be reading to you from my memoir, The Dragons, the Giant, the Women. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's a story about my, my family's um, immigration from Liberia to the United States, but also um, an exploration of identity as a Black immigrant woman. I'm going to read to you from the section that is present day me, um, and it explores a series of events that led to my um, return back to Liberia after being away for about 26 years. Sata, I was still broken. I wanted a way out from thoughts of him and Sata's memory came to me one night and stayed. It was a dream about her jug of palm oil, which she carried like a baby that day she came for us. I woke up and said her name in the dark, surprised to have remembered it all those years later. At that point, I could not remember when last I had been outside. Some weeks prior, I went to a store just below Eastern Parkway, one of the only stores of its kind that still existed among the deluge of coffee shops and yoga studios to buy palm oil and frozen cassava leaf to make the dish I knew would heal me, the only Liberian dish I made that tasted like mams. When I arrived, a sign informed me that the store had closed indefinitely and returning to my apartment, I felt everything that I had been avoiding crashing hard into me, tears staining my skin. I have not been able to wash them off for some time. Before moving there, I rid the place of ghosts. I burned sage, the Oma say the spirits do not like the odor. I then called ma'am and asked her to pray, certain they would listen to her voice, ascending in that musical way it did from my phone speaker before they obeyed mine. I've been thinking about that woman, I told her that late fall. What woman, ma'am asked. The rebel from the war, I, I dreamed about her. Oh, she said when the silence overstayed. Have you spoken to Kay recently? A couple days ago, I said. And you've eaten today? I made cereal, I said. Her name was Sata, right? Yes, she said and breathed deeply into the phone. You'll be all right, Tutu. And ma'am made that sound of married curiosity and indifference, an impossibility, her best invention. The five or so steps from my bed to the kitchen felt like uphill lunges. I spent too long looking into mirrors, too long sleeping, buried under covers still marked with our collective smell. Every moment I was not working. I had made it to my living room that day and I opened the large window where I placed a vase of ma'am's favorite flowers, lilies, now dried and unrecognizable in the escaping sun. The sill was cold when I climbed onto it, and I rested my slippers on the fire escape where children played below as we once did. And the Brooklyn drivers honked in the street while bits of conversations and laughter spilled from their car windows on the backs of words like move and fell and going and tomorrow. And the sirens came toward me from the distance then disappeared again behind those words. And the new transplants hurried home as gentrifiers do when it is almost dark and they're still fearful of corners. I leaned my head against the still and wondered how I smelled, how I looked, if music would ever sound the same, especially those songs I knew by heart. We called shortly after and I almost did not answer the phone because I did not care for the questions. How are you, she asked, this time while exhaling, her daughter's loud in the background. I'm fine, I answered. You getting your work done? I am, I said, fighting the urge to look at my computer desk, the remote office where I spent a few hours a day consulting and freelance writing, then glaring into the orbit while an unedited novel sat idle on a minimized screen. Did you get out today? She sighed. I'm outside now, I mumbled, staring through the holes beneath my feet, three stories down to the ground below. 
outside, outside, or on your fire escape? I did not answer. So she said my name in that way only ma'am would. Then there was that familiar litany of consolation, fumbling pauses and attempts to make me laugh, her optimism harsh against my ears. She reprimanded her girls every few minutes, and if I were well, I would have smiled. She was that good at it. I'll be fine, I said. I just need time. And I'd eaten my cassava leaf, the way they made it in La, spread over parboiled white rice drenched in an oil with shrimp, with dry fish and pepper that wounded my lips, red in my skin, and those meats that required both hands to eat. New York. By my mid-twenties, the transients around me were already collecting AA chips from too many weekends in Chelsea, habits that I always felt unnatural to me because I have a low tolerance for pain and hangovers, and because the fundamentalist shadow of ma'am and papa's early Sunday mornings in Texas, even during my self-proclaimed late teen rebellion, remained. My habit during those years was love stories, grand, provoking, almost silly, intoxicating, plagiarized from romantic comedies and Old Testament scripture. I'd fallen in love in that city and been out of it too many times to count. And so I fit in perfectly there, in that way wanderers like myself do in refined cities, where most wear love like loose garments. But he stuck. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just exhaling because I just <laughs> took in everything that you that you gave in in presenting that passage. And I guess I, I have questions I'd like to ask, but I want to know about that passage, what it represents to you, why out of everything that you could have read in the memoir, why, why would we start there? Um, it is the, it's the first passage or it's the introduction of the, my, my present day voice and really what initiated that, um, that return home, which I had been avoiding for so long. It was actually a heartbreak that led me back. You know, people have different inspiration. Yeah. Um, and so I like reading from that section because it makes me remember. <laughs> it forces me to remember, um, you know, how I felt when I finally made the decision that, that I needed to be back in Liberia. Home was the beating drum. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the other passages, because it's the childlike voice and my mother's voice, I think I, I find greater comfort in reading from, from the present day, to be honest. <laughs> That's so, it's so interesting. We do strange things uh, after heartbreak, <laughs> but it's interesting that you are describing um, this sort of needing to return to uh, a motherland, a mother space, which is where the memoir took me when your family resettled the first time. Uh, in your in your ma'am's village, and so uh, I guess I want to I want to kind of unpack this concept of returning to trauma, returning to pain, and what that does. Was it the process that you went through in producing your memoir? Was it similar to that physical return? Um, in producing, so to be honest with you, I feel like I've been writing some version of this for a very long time, either through journal entries. You know, I've obviously went through the cliche teenage years where it was like poetry was how I expressed myself, <laughs> expressed um, my past. Yeah. And, and then it was later on, I started, you know, collecting essays during these different periods that I had in life. And um, it was when I returned to Liberia that I realized that the, the story that I had been working on and this reflection that I'd been working on for so long, um, it was ready right? It took its shape. Um, and so I would say like the process, it wasn't, it wasn't um, concentrated at all. It wasn't over one period of time. Um, it's been constant. It's been something that's been in the making for a very long time. There are some passages in there, even the one that I just read to you was an essay that I wrote. Um, and that section actually be begins with an essay. I wrote the essay and then when I started to put together the book, I then returned to the essay and said, you know, this is really when it all began, that desire to, to return. That's so, so fascinating because now that you sort of reveal that the way that the memoir sort of um, breathed to me was in these sections, right? That they were completely different, even 
you, although you're not a character, I could sort of sense the different moments in your life through the way that the memoir sort of comes together. And I have to be honest, well, I, I want to be honest and say She Would Be King rocked me to uh, my core, and I describe it to my students and my family as the, the novel that I've been waiting on. Um, mm -hmm. I told my sister a little earlier that she knows my love for Octavia Butler, Toni Morrison, and Chimamanda Adichie, and I said, this sister Wayetu is like, I don't like to compare, but she's a hybrid on her own level of everything that I love about those three uh, women in their work. So uh, I want to sort of give you those flowers because uh, I used your book in classes and one student I'll never forget, he said, you know, I can feel June Day's freedom. Uh, when he read She Would Be King and I, I wrote that down immediately because I felt the same way and I hadn't been able to put it into those words. So I only bring all of that up to say um, when I read your memoir, there were moments where I could smell and feel she would be king. So I wonder about the connection between the two pieces. Clearly, there's a, there was a different process, right, in you producing these works. And one is uh, sort of, you know, faction is what I call it, fact and fiction mixed together. And the other is your memoir. So how are these texts connected? And there seem to be some Easter eggs as they use in sort of the film industry uh, in the memoir. So I would say that at a craft level, I definitely use the same um, methods in memoir that I do in fiction, right? Um, so I, I would say that fiction functions in, in the abstract and you're trying to make a concrete story. You're trying to concretize these very abstract ideas and themes and, and memoir, functions more in the concrete. You know exactly what happened, how it happened. Right. And you're trying to then pull from the concrete these various abstractions that help people to explore and really dissect the human condition. And what I try to do is to have some sort of like an interchangeability between the two. Like how can I, you know, create, start off with the abstractions when it comes to even a memoir and then use this concrete story to flesh out those abstractions as opposed to let me write down what happens and then see where it goes and then hopefully yeah. the, the natural themes come come out of those and I, don't, and I don't think that either of those are right or wrong it's just like a it's an issue of style and I think for me what happened what works for me is to look at story and to approach story um, from the abstract, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's something, it's it's definitely a cultural inheritance because mm -hmm. I remember growing up and the stories that I heard, there was like, you know, there would be a plot and a subplot and a sub subplot and there was always <laughs> a lot going on. Yeah. Because I mean, that's what our lives are. And I think what's happened in, in many ways, literature, traditionally literature, you'll find that we are looking for those through lines, the thing that happened and then and then and then but none of our lives are like that. Our lives are so dynamic. Like you have this through line of the Mississippi Book Festival and you probably have like 10 or 12 others that you've been an active part of today, right? Absolutely. And so then when we tell stories, why do our stories not have that texture? And so I think it's always been an interest of mine to make sure that I'm honest with that texture, with those abstractions in both of the works. And so perhaps that's the reflection that you saw, um, was my navigation of nonfiction as if it were a fiction exercise. The fact that you are, are sharing that, it becomes more apparent to me now because I had to stop myself in intervals and say, wait, this really happened. And you know, like, let me go online and make sure this person is still, still alive. Like, this, do I have to be afraid of what's gonna happen? <laughs> this, these yeah. are not characters. Yeah. Uh, that um, was what was really beautiful about the way that you shaped that for me is that you were able to somehow weave whimsy into immense pain and uh, tremendous uh, trauma. That there were moments, especially um, in your voice as a five-year-old, where it, it turned into fantasy and we were imagining with you and we could see a dragon and we could see a giant and so, 
I'm curious about uh, how much of it, what, uh, how much of your process in producing the memoir and weaving in this sort of fantastic reality uh, mm -hmm. was also a part of you sort of reconciling your past, perhaps in a different way than you had. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that's a good question, but no, I, it was, it wasn't like a divide, like a coping mechanism at all. I just think that the way that I naturally approach story is from that very wild, fantastic lens. And as I spoke before, I think that's definitely a cultural inheritance. Mm -hmm. The ways that I was introduced to story, there was always some fantastic element, somebody casting a spell, somebody flying, somebody disappearing, somebody... Yes poisoning somebody and then them, them they themselves like the person who was poisoned being resurrected and then being raised in Texas and you know learning from my uncle Billy about different elements of like Bodoon and the things that were happening in Texas with like the slave the plantation graveyards and yeah. how that was the truth and then also being in an environment where I was raised by fundamentalist Christians and so you know the bible stories they they preach those as truth that there was actually a man who was swallowed by a whale saved in the whale's belly the whale threw him up and yeah. that was that was a truth. I wasn't told, and talking yeah, I, and I wasn't told these things as if they were fantasy. I was told these things as if they were truth. And so because of that, I actually have to scale back the fantasy in my writing. So whether yeah. it's uh, you know fiction, nonfiction, whether it's me telling a story, I have to scale back that tendency to go the subplot, the subplot, 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 and then all of the dynamic things that are happening that some could view as magical or fantastic mm -hmm. within, within the story, right? Because yeah. another thing is that I think the, the, the fantasy elements, the magical elements are, um, are not the story, right? Like there, there are things that are happening, but they're not the story. Whereas I think, you know, generally because traditionalists or what's considered literature capital in the capital C American canon yeah. uh, would other this as genre fiction. Um, sure. So it's very, it, it, you know, it's hyper-realistic in many ways. Um, that's the kind of fiction that's celebrated. And so when you do have these magical elements in literary fiction, then the conversations do steer toward um, those elements and the use and the intention of those elements. Whereas if I'm in, when I'm in Liberia or in Ghana and I'm having conversations about the book, they don't, they're not asking me anything <laughs> about the magic at all. They're just yeah. like, oh, yes, and then the story, and then there was the, 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 the girl and why did she fall in love? It's, it's about those themes. And so I do think that a, a lot of it has to do with what we have categorized in American literature as literature, as serious storytelling, and what we have relegated to the sidelines and othered as um, lacking the sort of seriousness and clout of storytelling. But that's, I think, a conscious choice because you don't have to pay attention to the magical elements. You could just pay attention to the story. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, and what, what you're saying just draws me you know, back to um, Morrison and this concept of you know, like magic is just a part, when you talk about cultural inheritance, it's just yes. a part of everything we know. I mean, I was raised in Mississippi, so I have always heard about and believed in what my grandparents called, you know, Hanks, which was synonymous with ghosts. And there were these very, I have a, a great uncle who believe that he saw a ghost on a road and it changed his life and he stopped drinking alcohol that day and this was like you know, six he years. probably saw that ghost Ebony. he saw yeah, the ghost he saw the ghost I, and i mean even if i didn't believe it i would never tell <laughs> of that you know what i'm saying and so, so it, it um it's one of the things i think that has always connected me to literature like morrison and, the, and her definition in that this is not magical realism this isn't i'm not writing uh science fiction this is mm -hmm. this it is what it is and this is what we believe and this is what has happened and this is how we explain uh mm -hmm. our past and so i very much appreciate uh your embracing of that mm -hmm. concept and it, it also for me and this you swung into focus i think for me with she would be king and it just cemented with your memoir but uh, this concept of a diasporic narrative that you create that 
I very honestly, as someone who studies literature, don't see very often, right, this embracing of a global community of Black people uh, as community. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I read a great deal of um, literature specifically from the continent of Africa, and I don't always feel folded in, mm -hmm. right, as a, a, a Black American, but when I read She Would Be King, and it literally draws this trifecta between Virginia and Liberia and Jamaica. And one is not existing without the other. All of the entities that come from those three spaces need one another in order to achieve this level of liberation. For me, it was this love song to uh, people of the diaspora that you know we are we're not existing in a vacuum and we have these connections and our identities and experiences are all valid. Um, so I want to thank you for that because it was a lovely kind of conversation point in a few of my classes. Oh. But by the time I get to The Dragons, the Giant, the Women, I'm reading it as someone who has not experienced Liberia, but I experienced Liberia. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I guess maybe talk to me about writing from a space that is intimate to you in a way that welcomes folks who don't share that real intimacy? So, I mean, I, I think what I try to focus on is my truth. You're right that I do. I mean, I was, my dad's very much a Pan-Africanist. So I was raised, I think Liberia is a, is a Pan-Africanist story. Yeah. Um, it is a dream. It is successful. It was successful for so long um, before then it was, the success was sabotaged. Mm -hmm. And I was raised hearing stories about the interconnectedness of Black bodies around the world, right? That was just a part of my upbringing. Sure. So I knew, or I was always curious um, about exploring in literature how to then um, tell about this connectedness in a way that was thoughtful and in a way that also in the way that also exposed like the the, the nuance of our disconnectedness and yeah, yeah. life is you know um and its various effects over the centuries and so um i I knew and I was raised to know that a black body in Mississippi is going through a lot of the same things as the black body in Brazil, as a black body in Rome, as a black body in Kuwait, as a black body in Nigeria. And that's something that's very much a part of my understanding of what Liberia is and what Liberia represents. And so in just honestly approaching my story, um, the hope is that other people might see that interconnectedness, right? Or just take curiosity in what it is that, that connects us more than divides us. Because I do think that it was, that, that, disconnected with, that disconnectedness was, was very intelligently imposed. Sure. It's not by accident, right? Yeah. That and intentionally, it, perhaps. Yeah, it's not by accident that these groups around the world who have so much in common um, don't always see each other, right? Yeah. And so, how do we, how do we, um, how do we expose that intentionality as well in our work, um, in our conversations? How do we expose the fact that this was this was done to us, and and it's this was done to us. We subscribe to it. Sure. Um, began to do these things to each other and contribute. Yes. Now, how do we heal? Where do we go from here? Right. How do we heal? Mm -hmm. How do we heal? One of the um, moments, and I talked about like Easter eggs from She Would Be King mm -hmm. to uh, the dragon, the giant, the women, the giants, the women, the dragons, the giant, the women, is this concept of death and life mm -hmm. and the interconnectedness of those two states of being or not being. Uh, and so, and She Would Be King, I latched onto we will not die like i held on to that like a you know inner tube <laughs> in a, a, a swimming pool when i finished that that novel the, the second time i just 
we will not die. And it was, that's part of what I mean by it being, you know, the novel I had been waiting for, right? This affirmation. And so, and then there's a line in the Dragons, the Giant, the Women that says death is not the end. So I guess, you know, just share a little bit about how you are not necessarily reimagining death, but being very intentional about how it is to be defined in the context of these narratives that you've produced. Yeah. Um, you know, I have, I have an interesting relationship with, with death. Um, I think there's, it's a mixture of just being naturally spiritual. I think I would have always been a spiritual person, even if I weren't raised by Christians. Sure. Um, and then also the fundamentalist Christianity that I was raised in and always, you know, knowing or being taught that you, there's like life after this, there's something after this, there's something bigger than this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that I think even from a young age, when I was a child, I, I would always ask questions like, well, what do you, what do you mean like a heaven? So then what, were we in heaven before we got here was this is this some kind of continuum yeah i didn't i even as a child i remember having those conversations with my dad that i didn't i didn't understand this going to a place after having a life on earth i i without having been there before like i thought that you know this the act of death is more or less like an act of returning yeah. and i see wow. that spirituality, religion, all of that tries to explore is like, what are we returning to perhaps? Um, and so that's probably what you are reading in, in the work is that that, that constant meditation mm -hmm. of, and sometimes it's existentialist. Certainly in my twenties, I was more along those lines of like, oh, but why and why? And reading so much um, and trying to, trying to answer some of these questions and make sense of them and then I think my piece comes in the affirmation that it's that it's never really gonna make sense like in, in, in the yeah. same way that like death isn't fully um death isn't fully understood life I don't even think is fully understood like the the instances the the uh that are dynamic the anomalies the things that happen that make you think oh there's something very intelligent and thoughtful that's at play that perhaps we aren't giving consideration to. And so those have been meditations since my childhood. And that's, I believe probably what you're picking up on is this concept of, um, of, of returning, what it, what it looks like, what shape is it? Like, does it have a, sh does it have a shape or, or is this a thing that also exists in the abstract that we've, we've, we're, we're certain that, you know, you, when someone transitions and their their eyes close, their hearts stop beating, and they're no longer here. But are they really no longer there? Like what what it? I can feel someone's energy. Yeah. Can't see who's in the same room as me, who I can't see. I can feel that energy, mm -hmm. and I think that that is just as um, just as brilliant, and shouldn't be overlooked. Just as um, as stunning as the idea that our bodies can just stop, yeah. can just stop, you know, what happens to that energy? And I remember when I was maybe like, I had to be like six or seven, because I was always, I was the daughter who, after Sunday school or after study class, I was always asking questions like, well, well in chapter so and so in this book, it said this. Before. It says, you know, just as a baby, you know, yeah. just being being so curious, and that isn't it's it isn't anything that's ever been answered for me, and so I'm I'm drawn to these things that I can't answer. I'm I'm obsessed with these things that are unanswerable, and death is one of them. God is one of them. Love is one of them. You know. Yeah these sort of infinite things that are so much larger mm -hmm. than our existential like, yeah. selves. I can, 
I can completely relate to that. When we got to that moment in one of my classes, you know, we will not die. Uh, so I allowed students to kind of respond to that and, you know, say what they thought that that meant. And what's, what's really beautiful about their responses where it went specifically to um, us black people as this, this tribe, this community. And the fact that we have not died, right? Like physically, not necessarily even physically, but this sort of spirit, this energy um, that you speak of. And, and that seems to be sort of a cultural inheritance that um, this survival is beyond the physical. So, you know, ancestors whose bodies are at the bottom of the ocean, the bottom of um, the mafia, that they, they did not die, right? This spirit, this energy, this strength. And now we find ourselves it, again um, in terms of American history at this moment of uh, the boiling over mm-hmm. of the tension, the tension between uh, Black communities and this country. Mm-hmm. And so those, those two phrases from two different novels that you wrote in two different times uh, that didn't exist in, you know, the now, those lines about death being uh, this continuation of what we know as life and how limited what we know um, really is. It's just one of the very, the many sort of uh, triggering and um, really remarkable points in your work. I think I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention and sort of praise and celebrate in this moment the focus on uh, female power, uh, strength, resilience, fortitude. I really cannot even um, give it the terminology that it deserves, but this necessity of femininity. Uh, obviously, and she would be king, but very much so in the memoir. Uh, very much so, even. In my own research, I look at motherhood and food ways as resistance specific to Black, those elements specific to Black communities. And the part where you say in the memoir, why hadn't they asked a woman, (laughs) you know, what to do? And this is your five-year-old self Mm -hmm. sort of asking this, having this sort of internal um, dialogue with yourself about, you know, why hadn't they asked a woman? Because what my mama would have done is fed that dragon and let him out. Uh, yep. I don't want to do too many spoilers <laughs> for folks who are, who now have their appetites wet for this memoir, but um, maybe share a little bit about, it's very obvious the impact that the women in your family have had on your development and your sort of journey towards liberation in the way that you narrate it. But um, talk maybe about how critical it was for you as an artist to capitalize that, emphasize that in your work? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say, I mean, I, I, I love my daddy so much. I'm a daddy's girl. Yeah. Um, I was raised around just very strong women. I mean, and girls. I mean, every, my sister has four daughters. My um, younger sister and sister-in-law, they're both pregnant with girls. And we're just like, you know, we're, uh, very, yeah, we're just very, like, um, you know, woman-centric family. My mom has five sisters, one brother, and so I have a, was raised with plenty of aunties. Um, and I feel as if, you know, a, a, a lot of times when we are talking about stories and we're talking about histories, particularly of these countries that like a, a country like Liberia, very dynamic history, and the the women's roles in the building of these countries are largely missing. Um, to social conflict, even to present day yeah. political conflicts in some of these countries, the women's roles again are missing. When you when you t- hear about child soldiers, rehabilitation efforts, they're largely focused on male soldiers and not women. What were they going through? Why did they, you know, become a part of the war? How did they get out? How are they? very now and and that's something that intrigued me it's like in absentia i realized that there was like um one there's a strength because then 
if we're absent from the narrative, it's almost like we have the space and the time to do the actual work. <laughs> and we have to do the actual work. Well, you know, okay, go ahead. Have a right. shoot. Have a, little, <laughs> have a little photo shoot. You know, do your little rectal history. Right. I'm, I'm Next making, year, making sure people are alive. <laughs> exactly. And so, um, but then the other side of it is knowing that, you know, there we do have a responsibility. I feel like as an artist, I also have responsibility to elevate some of these stories that have lived in absentia for so long. So um, when I started to go back to Liberia and really wanted to find Tata, I was reaching out to journalist friends of mine wow. who had access to these communities of child soldiers and had opportunities to interview these women, these, these former women soldiers and everything that had been through and you know everything that they had come from and, and, and how they were, how they were rehabilitating if they were how a lot of them were reconciling with their participation in the war and and in having those conversations it, it forced me to um, expand even further my understanding of and re my respect of womanhood right mm -hmm. um, all that it entails um, and for that I'm, I'm 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 grateful I'm grateful to be a woman I love being a woman I love being a black woman. I love uncovering these different layers and corners and um, nuggets every day or every season. And I'm like, oh yes, yes, of course. That too. Of course. <laughs> people who are a part of it, of course. These women had a, a business and were trafficking people's, you know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. Was happening. Of course. Yeah. Um, and that's, and I, and I find great joy in that. I think uh, I'm just like, hey amen finger snapping over here to you saying all of this sort of, of course, it, like absolutely we are that. And this was happening when I found out things about Ida B. Wells and all of these black women in Mississippi and uh, studied the, uh, the women's war in Nigeria of 1929. Like, of course, mm -hmm. women were like rebelling and resisting and had a, 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 were on the forefront of all of these different movements and I think you center it so well in a way that I think aligns with the concept of womanism, either the way that it's defined by Alice Walker or the way that it's defined by so many um, African womanists and theorists in that it doesn't dismantle, necessarily dismantle or challenge these other systems because it exists. So when you talk about being raised around really strong women, one of the moments that struck me in your text, because I'm a daddy's girl too, mm -hmm. was um, your grandfather insisting that his daughters would be educated. Mm -hmm. And I, I sat there, I think in the moment that I was reading that, my, my two daughters were sleeping next to me and just reading that, I, I mean, I just had this sort of cathartic moment. I could have been crying because both the babies were asleep at the same time or because <laughs> <laughs> I did it today, but with this moment that this this big man who had told his wife, "You're about, you're gonna be mine. I want you," mm -hmm. right? And there was this traditional moment have, happening of him asking for her from her parents, but then also him being progressive mm -hmm. in that way to say, "No, my daughters are going to have this." Uh, advantage and we're going to shift the narrative of our family in this way. I thought that was just such a beautifully um, critical moment because a lot of these um, a lot of these texts that we get access to that narrate the liberation of certain African nations, we don't get those sort of intimate familial moments because there's such a big story to tell. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that you were able to um, take that moment. I mean, it's a paragraph, if, if that much, mm -hmm. to characterize your grandfather without being didactic and saying, he was a man that was this. No, yeah. this is what he did. And I think that for, has the potential for your readership to demonstrate more. Yeah. Then he, he 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 was he could he could be a traditionalist and also a feminist. Because he was human, I'm assuming. Right? Exactly, exactly. And I think I am who I am because I'm from a, a actually a, a long line of feminist men. 
Mm -hmm. right? And um, I think in that context, it's necessary because if my dad were traditionalist, um, he would have said, no, why are you going? No, you're not going to go to New Your York. Your mom, we wouldn't have started this. Exactly. You yeah. know, you have three, we have three kids. Why do you, you don't need any more education. I have a great job. You're going to stay here. But being, having that openness, knowing that she had dreams too, celebrating that, elevating that, um, and being able to say, you know, I got this. We'll figure it out. We'll take care of the girls. Saved our lives. Yeah. You know? And so I think. Yeah, very literally. Yeah, literally saved our lives. And understanding the role that fem feminism plays among women, but then also just among men. The men have to be feminist as well in order for, um, for these families to continue, these legacies to continue. It requires feminist and feminist-minded men. 100%. There's a moment. I said I wasn't going to do spoilers. I hope I'm not spoiling it for anyone. But just like, go read it if you're listening to this. But the moment where you all save your father's life, right, by being, being children, mm -hmm. but also like not taking no for an answer and not accepting that children should be seen and not heard, all of these sort of things that we're told uh, that, especially girl children, are told you you and your sisters defy that at the ages of four, five, and six. And as the result, you know, I'm assuming as the reader, mm -hmm. that moment saved your father's life. Mm -hmm. And and so I won't tell y'all what chapter that is, but it happens <laughs> <laughs> in that moment. Um, and so I think you impress that upon the reader, perhaps not even deliberately, uh, over and over again, but it's done in a way that I think gives us uh, a true depiction of Liberia specifically, right? And folks who were forced to resettle mm -hmm. from Liberia in a way that is equitable, in a way that is human, in a way that draws us in to not ever truly understanding, but appreciating that these narratives survived and these, um, that people were able to survive um, this circumstance. And I like that you frame it too as the sabotage, right? Of uh, the nation specifically of Liberia that led to this. So while we, you know, as a people contribute a great deal sometimes to our oppression, that sabotage is there at the root. There's something at the root that, that spawns all of this. So I guess I want to kind of, as we get towards the end, get a little bit lighter, I guess, in our discussion and just kind of talk about, I, I talk about food a lot. I am a Mississippian. And so <laughs> we eat a lot of deep fried everything. But, uh, and f so food always grips me uh, yeah. in my reading. And uh, you don't disappoint because we get to start out with birthday greens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> which <laughs> greens have very symbolic meaning um, culturally mm -hmm. in my family and you know southern heritage as well mm -hmm. here in the States. but talk to me about whether or not you felt pulled back to sort of the culinary memories of your experience and sort of putting this thing into something that you were going to share with us. Oh, yes. I mean, li li Liberian food is like this hidden treasure that I'm always talking about. And one day yeah. we'll make some sort of Brooklyn restaurant that has a lot of Liberian food in it. Right. Invite me to the soft opening. Come on. <laughs> I will. I just, it's, it's so delicious. It's so delicious. And it is, has always been how I connect with home when I'm away. Yeah. It's, how, it's what my mom used to connect us to home while we were away, right? Yeah. We, even though we were in, a, you know, a, a Texan suburb, mm -hmm. we would go home and we always had our traditional dishes. So palm butter, cassava leaf, potato greens, flour sauce, you know, jello fries. We had all of those. That's what they used food and music to tether us to home even though it was so far away. And so it's very much a part of my understanding of Liberia and my understanding of my Liberian identity is, is, is its food. And so um, 
I had to find a way to make make food a character, <laughs> a supporting <laughs> cast member somehow. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not very hard for someone who looks for food, right? Like that that's <laughs> my connection point. I if I don't understand all of the 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 language and the experiences, I certainly understand the emotion that surrounds like eating and food ways and and heritage and community and memory. So it's interesting as you mentioned, you started naming all of these ingredients and the, this food stuff, and you mentioned jollof rice. Mm -hmm. and so I have family and friends from different West African countries who one, all claim to have the best jollof, right? <laughs> but yeah, and I see there's an eye roll going on for everybody. Yeah, we're not even part of the conversation. We're just sitting back with like our little cup of tea, like, okay, <laughs> go off. It's so interesting. <laughs> exactly right like it's very and so this is where i think like our global southernness comes into play because you know being a mississippian there are folks who are like oh we have the best catfish and i'm from like arkansas and we're like mm, but do you you know so i i like this conversation about that draws us in again as this global community uh about food and mm -hmm how it narrates a lot of our existence, but I, I want you to kind of weigh in on, <laughs> on the best Liberian dish. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm a cassava leaf person. Like mm -hmm. I'm cassava leaves all day. I will eat cassava leaf for breakfast if you give me the opportunity to. <laughs> and that's especially like the greens from the cassava plant that they grind and then boil and they mix it with all different kinds of meats and palm oil. And then you put that, the greens, over rice. Right. Over rice. And I could eat that all day for days, for days. Like I could you eat Yeah, like every food group there, right? You have your starches and uh -huh. your leafy greens. You have the leafy greens. Um, and obviously they're trying to find ways to minimize the consumption of palm oil um, because it is so heavy in cholesterol. But there are, I mean, people there are like, healthier options for cassava <laughs> you know like people even in Liberia are trying to be more health conscious when it comes it to it. Taste is good, right? It tastes so good. God <laughs> it's just so delicious. It's it's next level. I, I would like actually encourage so speaking of Liberian food, there's a website. Yeah. L I B food and they're based in Atlanta. And yeah, they're based in Atlanta and he ships Liberian food across the country. I was about to say, where are you getting yeah. these cassava leaves? No, I mean, I, I'll just go. I mean, I'm in Brooklyn, so you know, it's, right. it's, so I'll go to find something on Fulton, some store, and then I'll cook it. But for anyone else who maybe doesn't have access to African food supplies and, and things no, like I that, just, they just want to try it. It's a good starting point. I'm glad it's accessible, right? We just did a little commercial for this <laughs> website. <laughs> I'm excited. I, I mean, that's where I'm headed after we after we wrap up. <laughs> it's, it's it's have it, right? like, Do it, and then please email me and let me know what you think. Oh yeah, and yeah. I, I mean, I don't. I need I need some tips, so I might need to email you before I try these things. <laughs> I want to get it right. I want to get it right. So I guess I also kind of want to get your take on once this once you complete a work. There's a feeling. To that right but also after it is a shared with an audience I think perhaps there's a there's another feeling or another emotion that's layered on top of having had it finished and having cover art and all of that so what does it mean to you what it what does it felt like to share this very intimate uh close deep serious uh tale of your life and your family's life and experience Mm -hmm. With us, with perfect strangers mm -hmm. um, who can never really appreciate your family like you can, cannot appreciate your homes, yeah. uh, you know, like you can. What has it meant to you to share this? I, to be honest with you, like, and I, I was actually just talking to a close girlfriend today about how private I am. She was mm -hmm. like, you're so private. Nobody knows. And we're, mind you, like, some of it was in the context of the memoir. She was just like, yeah. You know, you share a lot, but you've shared nothing. <laughs> <laughs> there are all these pages and we don't know you. No, I'm kidding. And I feel like that's, that's pretty accurate. Like, it's a story that I think, um, you know, part of being in America, people will say, oh, where you're from. Yeah. Like, oh, 
Texas. So they go, but your name, your look, where are you from, from mm -hmm. Liberia. So they start talking, you know, asking questions. And so the immigration story, our immigration story was always sort of part of these conversations that I'd had over the years. So I don't, I, I, I don't consider it as um, revealing anything that's, that's totally private, right? Or anything that I wouldn't tell someone in the street if they asked me, because I also think that the story is just a testament to yeah. how outstanding and surprising life can be sometimes, right? How these things, these, you know, disconnected things all work together to make it so I'm sitting here today having this conversation with you. I think that that's a story that deserves to be told. So while personal, um, I, there was no part of the story that I thought that I, I was oversharing or I felt exposed by, because these things, I mean, going through a breakup in your 20s, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> dating and dating in your twenties. Those yeah. are things that I mean. Those are that. That's everyone's story, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I can't say that I felt any any hesitant. The the only part that I I was really nervous about in the story was actually embodying my mother's voice and wanting to do that in the right way. Wow! Right? Wow! Uh, that's 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 what I was very sensitive about and had conversations with her about. Um, but otherwise. I, I can't say that I felt like I was exposing myself in any way that um, that I would regret because I did think that this was um, one, the, the story about the war was something that I thought could really elevate um, people's, um, people's inquiry into like our, the spiritual intentionality of yeah. like the world and our existence um and that's something that's that's worth worth sharing if that's the end result um and then also i don't everybody has had a love story everybody has had breakups and um and if there was a way that i could talk about mine while making people laugh then <laughs> <laughs> at your own expense <laughs> Yeah, no, my mom actually, she called because we were, I was laughing with a friend of mine when the book came out because I remember when I wrote the chapter on the Tinder profiles and we were just on the phone <laughs> laughing. And the couple was like, are really, is it the same, the same guys who everyone's scrolling through? You know what I mean? <laughs> because the profiles, I mean, if some of them were obviously what we would do is every once in a while we were on the, this is bad. We would take screenshots of some of the, the profiles, like, oh my gosh, look at this. Or do you know him? Oh my goodness. And so it's in remembering that 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 chapter specifically came from. And it was just so much fun to write. I don't I don't I I'm I don't think I revealed much of anything in the book to tell you the truth yeah. <laughs> compared to like the full scope of my life. But exactly. it was, like it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun to write. That the that section, like the dating and even with the, the heartbreak and talking about my friends and how important my friends were to me and that process of recovery, like all of those were just deeply enriching to write. I think you do it in a way, so, so like the hilarious parts as well as the very serious parts, you do it in a way where at least I was reading and interjecting myself, right? Or my friends or my past self. Uh, and so, that's those are those moments I have to keep reminding myself. I'm like, wait, this is real. This really happened, right? So, everything like snatch yourself out of this narrative and right, like give, you know, pay homage to someone's real life experience. But I think it's really beautiful because you create an opportunity for folks to not connect necessarily to you, but to a lived experience. Mm -hmm. And I even think, you know, one of the many brilliant uh, devices that you sort of employ, whether it's intentional or not, is sort of this metaphor of the mind of folks engaged in war and love and relationships and separation and coming back together. That there's this, this sort of really beautiful meta, these beautiful metaphors that you create where there is no opportunity to judge, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't judge your mother. We can't judge, um, 
different warring factions in the Civil War. We can't judge, we can't even judge, right, like the, the person on the other side of the heartbreak mm -hmm. because you give this opportunity to sort of inject, inject us. So we are dealing with ourselves as we read uh, the dragons, the giant, the women. Just be prepared to deal with yourself as you you read this. Thank you, thank you very seriously. You have um, I, when I read she would be king, and then I read that you were had you had another text sort of right on the heels of it. Uh, to be honest, I thought, oh wait, this, you know, like I need to breathe. I can't, like you know, <laughs> because uh, you just produced um, really beautiful really beautiful, engaging work that I think is necessary uh, for every community, for every community, not just the communities that you write out of. So I think the, the ending question is, you said a little bit about what your friends said uh, when the book came out, but I'm, I'm very curious about your family and when, if they read it, right? And when they read it, what, what it does for them and that they shared with you? I mean, I'm from a family of, we would call my parents and say, oh, you know, we, I, I got this award, I, you know, <laughs> I'm doing this thing that sounds fantastic. And they're like, that's good, that's great, that's great. <laughs> uh, have you done the dishes? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, did you eat today? <laughs> yeah, like it's just, um, they, they, they celebrate, um, our lives and they celebrate our journeys and they celebrate the methods um, in which we're using to go about our, our individual lives. Um, but they, I think mostly my parents stay, I mean, obviously they, they love me and are very proud of me, but they're, they don't, they don't drink any Kool-Aid. They don't believe any hype. <laughs> You're like, we love you. We're proud of you. Are you healthy? Are you happy? Like those are their concerns. Yeah, yeah. Um, parents. With every member of my family, they're like, "Oh, I read you. It's 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 great." And I obviously like I sent it to my sister, and they're they're just they're wonderful. They're my best friends, and so we're nothing but supportive. And um, yeah, my family's they're they're great. They're the same character that you read in the in the story. Well, it was nice. Tell them all. It was very nice to meet them. Yeah, <laughs> there was some relatability. Certainly yeah. relatability there with sisters and being a yeah. daddy's girl and yeah. father who is a force uh, still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're totally supportive, um, totally unfazed. <laughs> they're just like, you know, what are you doing this weekend? Like, we're not, we don't talk about the book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we just, we don't, we don't talk about it. Um, my family were more or less, how are you doing today? How are you doing in this moment? Are you well? Are you happy? How's your soul? Mm -hmm. um, and then, and those are our conversations. And I think like when there's an event, like this book would be like an event in my family's life. And then there's like a moment of like, this is great. We're proud of you. And then it passes. And I think that I've always appreciated that because then you don't believe your own hype to the point where you stop doing the work. Sure. Yeah, I was about to yeah. say thank them because you. yeah, when you have people to like help you to understand, like it's always about the work. Like I always want to be creating. Mm -hmm. I always want to be thoughtful about what I'm creating, and if I, you know, pay too much attention to the business of the work and the response of the work, then it'll it'll corrupt my art and it'll corrupt my artistic mm -hmm. journey. And so, I I do consider myself blessed to have my family and people who are like. Like, this is, this is wonderful. We're so proud of you. What are you doing tomorrow? What are your plans? Yeah. So what's next? you like, on to the next? Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful that you got that supportive community. Of course, we're all out here in the world singing your praises for these beautiful, beautiful narratives that you've graced us with and looking forward to what's next. So I won't ask you what's next. I know artists hate that. But I will ask you what it is that you want to do, right? It's not necessarily your next project, but what, over the course of your career, what is it that you want to do? So I can actually answer what's next. Oh, yes! Next, yeah. So I signed um, a book deal earlier this year with Viking. Um, yes. and it's another novel. 
and it's called Melanctha, and it's about a girl. She's a Liberian immigrant woman. It follows her life. Um, she realizes that she could breathe underwater. So she's actually the anti-Bessa because oh. she, she meets this like Mami Wata type figure yeah. in, the, in the lake who convinces her to use her power to rid the world of, of men, evil men. And so it's this, it's yeah. like Bessa turned on her head of what happens when a woman does not want to use her powers to be good, to be righteous. What if she allows herself to be human, obviously with boundaries wow. and within certain parameters, but what, what, what happens when a woman, a black woman is fully human um, with her power? And that's something that I really hesitated in writing and was scared to write because yeah. of obviously representation and wanting to make sure that everything that I was putting out was, um, you know, thoughtful and empowering. And so, sure. but then somebody said something really thoughtful, like, you know, Octavia, you mentioned Octavia and Tony before, they wrote Black Villainesses. Oh, like, totally. Come on, Sula. <laughs> yes. And so it gives you, it, it's been so fun to write because it's sort of given me the freedom to explore my art, another dimension of my art, where my characters are allowed to be full in a way that I think um you know for a long time i i was really committed to writing these you know inspiring empowering yeah. characters of color um and and so I'm, I'm excited about that project it's supposed to come out in 2022 that we'll be ready for it like we will have breathed through <laughs> all of this brilliance that you've given us before i'm excited about it and it, there i'm already reading into the metaphors of your explanation right we don't always use our powers for good mm -hmm. uh so and you know what does that yield i'm excited about it so just know when mom and dad are like okay yes fine uh <laughs> ebony is over here like screaming fangirling about me too it's just like is it it doesn't last like they're they're great I understand. But, but it's just like okay well that's great what? <laughs> they have that expectation. They know how great. Yeah. 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 Well, Wyatt, to thank you for spending Friday evening with me. What a fun okay. conversation. Thank you. I have been to thoroughly. Yeah. I, have. I mean, it feels like talking to girlfriends, and the oh. only thing we're missing was our evening cocktail. Exactly. But maybe next time. <laughs> next time, next book. <laughs> That sounds great. Um, it's so good to meet you and thank you. Thank you for this conversation. It's been, it's, been, it's been great, really refreshing actually. Yeah, I think I, we're starting the weekend off with a bang. At least I am. Yes, I'm on a high. Thank you so much. And we enjoy the book. If you haven't picked up The Dragons, The Giant, The Women, please do. Do yourself a favor. And if you haven't read She Would Be King, what are you doing? What have you been doing? Thanks, bye too. Bye, thank you. Bye. Uncomfortable is a series in the Mississippi Book Festival podcast, Right on Mississippi, which is presented in partnership with Mississippi Public Broadcasting. Mm -hmm.